Okay, so welcome to this Oxford Leader video. Uh, my name is Katie Hamilton and having had the pleasure of talking to Ben Apple the other day, I am joined today by Robin Trichler. Hello, Robin. Hello, how are you? I'm very well. Thank you for, for joining us on this call. So um, you were due to give a concert uh, tomorrow night, I think. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. with Graham Johnson uh, in a program of Schubert and Beethoven. So since we're not going to have the joy of hearing you actually singing live, uh, tell us about the program. What, what, did you, what did you have lined up for us? The program was, we started with Andy Fernaglieb of Beethoven, uh, Beethoven's year and all that. Um, so it made a lot of sense for us to do it. And it's, it was very helpful uh, that uh, I'm doing it a couple of times this year, so it was really nice to actually get a UK performance of it. Um, and then we went on to Schubert Meyerhofer poetry, uh, two big groups of that. And then we were going to finish with the Relstab half of Schoningesang. Um, there's a sort of a nice mirror there because we're starting in 1815, going through the Meyerhofer poetry, which is 1816 to about 1824, and then finishing off with Schoningesang at the very end. And possibly settings that Beethoven may have intended to make himself if he had uh, decided to, but I think they were on his desk maybe uh, in waiting. So it, I, th I thought it was a super program. Graham made it up. And uh, if you get to talk to him before tomorrow, he'll explain a, a, a lot more than I'm able to. But it, it, it was a, it's a really good mix of songs. And the, the Meyerhofer settings in the middle of the program were mostly um, classical mythological sort of settings, weren't yeah. they? Yeah, and they, you they take quite are. a dark, quite a dark take from Meyerhofer on quite a lot of the not only the subject matter but the way that he kind of treats the characters that he's writing about. I, oh, I think so. Um, Meyerhofer was a was. I I, I get the impression that he um, imposed a lot of his own biography on some of these, and so often you get. So I'm just thinking of songs off the top of my head, something like Atus, where he's seeing the the torment of this young man and he's he he feels it himself, something like not in this program, but Einsamkeit, where he was training in a religious order and he could tell Schubert exactly what it felt like to sit in that cell on his own. Um I th yes, I think they're very much a, a biographical feel to them. Um so he's he's taking the classical stories and making them suit his his own means really but of course Schubert took that and, and ran they the settings are fantastic um they're perhaps not actually there's a bit of a mix so we get some really um descriptive uh, compliment um whereas sometimes we think of Schubert uh, and a lot of song as sort of one chord one chord one chord repeated quaver is this thing and that does happen but that takes a lot of skill to do that, to make that interesting. So we had like Abendstern is perhaps one of the greatest songs he ever wrote. And it's incredibly complicated, but terribly simple at the same time. It's, it's a, a treasure and daunting to do when you have to do it as the singer. Yeah, there's that lovely, um, that lovely line from, from Benjamin Britten about um, Winterreise, that, that as a pianist, um, he said, you know, it was it was terrifying because you open the score and there's there's nothing on the page. It's it, it's a strophic song, right? It's the first number. It's it seems to be terribly straightforward. And yet, despite the fact that the figuration might seem repetitive or relatively straightforward, it's carving away, carving away until all that remains is the absolute essential, which is why it may look like nothing. And yet there's such power in it. And in that instance, you have to make that sound as if you're just joining in. It's already been going on forever before the pianist plays a note. Uh, that's, that's so difficult, that one. So difficult. It's not like Schoenemöllen, which sort of has a, a rollicking start to it. This, to, to join into those songs is, is very hard. And I guess also the, the I mean, thinking of Artus and some of the other um, really kind of big dramatic um, mythological numbers, there's something quite operatic about the way that they're set up because there's so much description. Meyerhofer sort of weaves the backstory of these characters into the moment of action that we're actually joining in that story, yeah. for example. Um, 
that there is something of the kind of mini operatic canvas almost about the way that Schubert sets them up. As you say, so much description in the piano part for some of them. Well, if you look at something like, so we were going to be singing uh, Fatsum Hadis. Hmm. Not only is the range incredibly big, uh, it's a song I actually have to transpose up a tone because I don't have the low G, but the, the, the range is maybe two octaves. Um, so it's a, in, that is demanding enough. But then you have this setting, which is very thick, low down in the piano, which the voice in whatever key you're doing it in has to be able to bite through, to be, to be heard. And if, then if you want to add some color and some nuance onto that, you have to work very carefully with your pianist to, to find a path how that can be managed. In that song also, just from Meyerhofer, he, the, you're already damned before the song starts. Mm -hmm. So you're starting from this incredibly dark place and it's only gonna get worse as you accept it. It's, uh, God, they're, they're, they're very hard to do. Uh, I'm, I was very glad that we had an interval between the five and six or songs so, so we were doing, because it, it is not just physically draining, but emotionally draining to dredge all this up all the time. Um, it, they're, but they're wonderful, wonderful songs and well worth hearing. And do you notice a difference, given that the, the Meyerhofer songs are for the most part a bit, well, rather earlier than the Schwanengesang settings, is there a noticeable shift in, in kind of vocal idiom in the later Schubert settings? Obviously the texts are of a rather different character for the Hörstab than they are for the Meyerhofer. Um, I think, it's funny, I, I see a lot of similarities between the two sets of songs that you're talking about. Um, and even though there's 10, 12, 15, 14 years in between, how Schubert, so the, the piano, the, I think that, sorry, I'm gonna go back a step. The piano accompaniments, I think, are, are quite different. Um, there's an economy to Schwan and Gesang, and especially when we get to the Heine songs in Schwan and Gesang, there's an economy in the piano, which we don't necessarily appreciate in, in the Meyerhofer songs. They, there are more notes, perhaps, than he, Schubert would have used later on to describe uh, a deer running out of a, out of a bush he, he paints it beautifully, but later on, he might not have been so expressive. It's, he would have hinted at it somehow. Um, but in the vocal part, both Schwanengesang and the Meyerhofer settings are incredibly extreme. The range is massive. To go from Fartsam Hadis to something like Atlas or um, Abshid, or, where it's, they're really, they're very high and very low within the same bar. And I think that's something that Schubert nearly always did to display the extremes of the poetry and the extremity of his emotion that he was putting on the page. Um, do I sing them any differently? No, I struggle with all of them. <laughs> They're all difficult. Uh, but it's the, economy, it's the economy of the notes that as Schubert got older, that he, that he managed to find that it's, that is so impressive. That's really interesting. It, it sort of just pinging random connections in my mind. I was reading um, a, an article not long ago about the um, 20th century author, Penelope Fitzgerald, who for the most part writes really quite short novels and they're beautiful. Every word is exactly where it needs to be. And apparently she would write basically twice the length of the novel that would eventually be published and then she would pare it away pare it away so that what you end up with is just the words that were needed to make the point yeah. and i yeah. guess that that is that is the skill of of long experience that by the time schubert gets to the schwanengesang songs he's written he's got 400 500 leader under his belt by yeah. that point so he really is in a position to be able as you say to to reduce to its absolute essential and minimum the details in the piano part um, yeah. as a pianist himself. Um, Just the very essence of what he wants to say. I, it, yeah. yeah, yeah, you're right. That's, that's very good, yeah. Um, good, I'm glad you like it. Um, so, so how does that compare to the Beethoven? I mean, as you say, it's Beethoven year, Andy found a Geliebte as the first continuous song cycle, um, as, as Beethoven sort of slightly pipping Schubert to the post. 
um, yes. several years before he gets to writing Müllerin. Um, how does oh, it compare? The, but there is, Einz there is Einsamkeit in 1816 as well, which was is very much a almost a, a direct copy of Einz uh, of um, Beethoven and Die Liebte in the way it's made and and the challenges that Beethoven faced. I think Schubert was testing himself with this big 20 minute mm. song. Uh, very similarly. So sorry, but I interrupted. No, no, um, no. But I mean, excellent. Of course. Um, uh, yeah. Once the gauntlet's been thrown, Schubert's no slouch in uh, in, no. in, in seeing what what possibilities he can come up with. What is the Beethoven like as a vocal experience in comparison with, well, any of the other Schubert in the program? But I suppose contemporary Schubert to 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 Andy I, I well, in my limited experience of singing Beethoven, I haven't sung a lot of it. Um, I find um, Andy Fernigli to an extraordinarily beautiful thing to sing. There's a folk song type uh, approach to it where the singer has these beautiful, simple, perhaps very narrow ranging in each of the songs. So the first song, it's basically, all, no, it's a second song. It's basically within like a fifth or a sixth. It's very, very small. And the piano has all the variety and all, you know, the famous Beethoven who, who used to go to parties and improvise and somebody would shout out a tune. And, and it's all in this first couple of songs where the piano gets all the, the uh, attention and all the interest. And the singer sings this strophic song, but with these beautiful, simple lines. Now it's taxing in that some of the lines are very long and um, some of the word setting has to be, the breaths have, need to be very carefully managed. Uh, but the challenge is to make it beautiful mm. um, in a way that Schubert, when Schubert writes something that sounds like a folk song, people actually think it is a folk song because he managed to write one, one day it didn't exist and the next day it did because he'd written it down, but it sounds like it sounded forever. So it was always comfortable. Beethoven had to work a little bit harder at it, but um, as the singer, it's incredibly comfortable. For, I, I can't think of a better word actually. And the whole way through the cycle, everything sits very well. Um, the only thing that's very difficult in the Beethoven is his uh, dynamics. There's a lot of changes, very sudden changes, and his uh, tempo. There's a lot of rubato, or um, it's over half a bar, over one beat, over the, and it's this fabulous, um, it's how he's, he's displaying the contemplation and the emotion of, and the confusion of this man sitting on this hill, looking out on his own land, and he can't reach, can't reach over. And this, it's all in the tempo. And so that's a slightly more complicated thing than, than, than Schubert. I'm trying to think of a song where that is quite so common in Schubert and I'm struggling. Mm. Um, but in the Beethoven, that is difficult, it's the little details. I just did um, Fidelio at Covent Garden, and on the first day, Papano, he said, this orchestra is like a machine. You will not get through it unless you do exactly what Beethoven has asked you. And we were doing rehearsals, and he was uh, conducting the lengths of notes before you could cut it off. Because he said, unless you cut it off there and give me the consonant at that, the second flute and the thing that are going to be playing when you're supposed to be saying that, no one will hear you. And it's that exactness, is that a word? Uh, which this, the um, Andy Fernandez also demands. It's a, it is different. That's really interesting because I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I was involved in the, um, the Insights events at the Opera House on Fidelio. Oh, so you were. Uh, and uh, one of the things that, that several, of the, several of the other singers were saying was how, how frequently, particularly in the kind of big heroic moments, Beethoven is really quite unkind to his singers. He's, he's, not, <laughs> he's, he's not all of the things that you've just said about Andy Fernigalibde. He's not kind of comfortable and beautiful and straightforward that actually the demands that he places um, on, his, on his principal singers speak of somebody who wants what they want without necessarily thinking terribly kindly about the person who's got to somehow deliver. Yeah. Yes, but I think that's down to the text. Mm. He's been in Andy Fernigalibde, there's a line towards the end where it said, you must, I sing this artlessly. And it's 
this is where he gets this this folk song idea from. And so as the singer, you've got to try and make this beautiful, but without any sort of embellishment or too much um, disturbance of that line. In Fidelio, it's all about honesty, real life, honor, fidelity. And to paint that, and Beethoven took a long time to do it, to paint that he uses he uses speech. He use, you're, singing, you're singing things not quite the way you would say them, but almost. And that can be hysterical. And when you put that with an 80 piece orchestra, it, it can be very difficult. But it's, it's a, it's, they're very different things um, to compare the two. It's very hard. But the exacting, the exacting requirements are the same. That's fascinating. And I suppose Andy Fernig leaves to dates from, well, it's a year after, isn't it, the last version of Fidelio that he finally gets around, I think. You always get confused when he finally finished Fidelio. <laughs> <laughs> it's 1814 that he finally... Uh, yeah, so Andy Fernig leaves is 1815. Yeah. Um, but he doesn't write a lot of other leader. I mean, there are, of course, there, there's, there's probably, what, enough to make a concert just. Oh, um, yeah. But there's, there's quite a few you'd leave out. The, the, it's, they're not all, they're not, it's not like Schubert where there's out of, there's a, a handful that maybe you'd leave to the second disc. In, in Beethoven, there are quite a few that you might think, mm, I'll find something else to fill that 20 minutes. Uh, it's not, there's not, a, they're not all, they're not all wonderful. Mm. Interesting. That, you know, I'm sure I'm going to, don't, please don't write letters to me. But that's <laughs> how, I, how I, I, I just don't appreciate all of them, I think. I, they're not all winners. I can say the same about Mozart. Sure. I mean, of course. And also, it's partly how you program these things and, and what oh, we yeah. decide and, and how you kind of put things together. So it was, was it between the two of you that, that you and Graham kind of devised this program so that you had the, the Beethoven balance with the Schwanengesang? Well, it was he who came up with that. I offered the Meyerhofer and because um, I was I, I was very interested in them at the time. Uh, this you know when this this is programmed, we were talking eighteen months ago or a year you know a year ago, and uh, so I had offered those and I had said that I was uh, the Beethoven I was doing, and it was he who then chose the particular Meyerhofer and put the Rellstab at the end and. Uh, yeah, it, it's a shame we're not doing it because it, it, it is a really good program. And it was a lot of work to memorize all those words. <laughs> I'm sure. Well, I've no doubt another opportunity will arise when you can hope so. put that program together. So what other, um, what other projects have you got cooking at the moment um, to, to be looking <laughs> forward to in the future? It's such a shame. At the moment, I was doing, in just in these, let's say, three months, I had some really nice things coming up that I was really looking forward to. I was, I was supposed to fly back today from New York or yesterday from New York, having done, um, or supposed to have done, uh, Monteverdi Vespers. Mm. I memorized that because we were staging it. And it's taken months and months and months and months and months. And we were rehearsing in Paris and then the travel ban was announced and it all just disappears in a puff. And uh, so in the, the, I've sort of, it's a strange feeling to be in. I, I, the things that, m I, I, everything sort of might happen. Uh, mm. Even things in September, October, November, I have no idea. We don't, we don't know how this is all gonna work out. So I, I sort of, I'm not getting excited about anything. The first thing I'm sort of, not pinning my hopes to, but something I'm actually looking forward to is um, my first concert of 2021, is that next year? It is. Would be um, Winterizer. And that's the, first, that's the first thing in my head that I sort of logged on and thought, okay, that's probably gonna happen. Um, and you know, what better thing to look forward to? But everything else I've, I've sort of, yeah, I don't want to say given up on, but if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. So like, you know, we, we're all in this very strange state at the moment. Mm. Um, but there would have been some nice things. Um, a staged, staged Mozart Requiem in, in Vienna at the, at the um, Bachenfest, which would have been fun. Um, a couple more recitals. Um, I mean, God, a couple of Britain orchestra concerts, but it's... 
Yeah, you live events. The events challenge us all. Oh, well, indeed. Yeah. And as you said, it's, it's impossible to know quite when we're going to be absolutely back up and running across the board again. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so whilst you are, um, uh, as it were, um, earthbound, rather than having your wings clipped, rather than being able to, to jet set off and sing elsewhere, what have you been up to around the house? Oh, actually, I mean, I'm very, very lucky in that my job is also my hobby. I spend a lot of time sitting right here. I'm sitting at the piano right now, sitting at the piano. Um, and I have continued to spend time at the piano. I've been looking at a lot of American songs that have been on my wish list for a long time. Uh, I've been looking at some British music that I'd never seen before. I'm thinking of some programs and uh, I'm writing a, a, a script for something that if it ever comes up. <laughs> anyway, but uh, otherwise, the attic has been sorted, the cellar has been sorted, the, I have to paint a room, the garden has, which is waiting for some warmer weather and the garden will be attacked again. Um, no, there's plenty to this, I'm easily distracted, so there's plenty to do. Fantastic. So, and uh, Ben was saying the other day that he's got, he's got really into um, sorting and also cooking, that, that he, because he just ordered a huge pile of baking equipment. Uh, he kind of gets stuck in. <laughs> Um, whereas you're obviously going for the more kind of, you know, DIY, sort out the house, get, get set your house in order. In the, uh, approach. Uh, yeah, but well, I, you know, cooking is necessity. I do that every day anyway. Um, so I don't see that as a big treat. We're not going um, to have a celebrity Oxford leader bake off then. You don't think that's... Uh... Oh, God, no. <laughs> uh, no. The problem is I, I, I like to cook because I like to eat. It's not going to make it to Oxford. <laughs> Um, yeah, so no, 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 I, I'm, I'm not that, yeah, I'm not that way competitive. But the garden's going to look absolutely pristine by the time you're, you're back at work. Oh no, I can kill anything. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm very good at digging and moving things, but my husband does all the actual planting and planning and keeping things alive. I just do the, like the, la the labourer job. Um, that's all I do. Whereas I'm better, I'm better at other indoor things. And organising songs, for example, and, and going through poetry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you say that. I'm searching for two scores at the moment that I just cannot find. I don't know. I'll come across them somewhere. I was going to say, if, you're, if, if there's a big sort out happening, then who knows what other treasures you might uncover in the back of the cupboard. It's funny, isn't it? I'm very good at sorting things. I'm very good at getting rid of stuff. But music I can't, printed music I can't throw away. I, I, I have boxes of stuff that I just, I just couldn't dream of throwing it away. I might never ever use it, never sing it, but I don't know. It's, it's, it's very hard to, to think you'll, yeah, you'll never need it, because you might. Well, exactly. I was going to say, you may sing it, you never, you never can tell, which is the no. right way of it. No. And will you be... I suppose you're still working a bit, but are you keeping busy otherwise? How are you filling your time? Well, you can see that um, I've got uh, Brahms and the piano behind me. Um, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm still doing some notes, uh, some talks which have moved online, some teaching which has moved online. Um, yeah. But otherwise, I am doing quite a lot of walking uh, and also quite a lot of cooking. Um, I am doing quite a bit of sorting out of the very many books. Um, I did yeah. sort the sheet music quite recently, but the CDs are, uh, they need attention, shall we say. Um, and, uh, <laughs> um, and look, it's still Beethoven year, which means there's still an awful lot of things about Beethoven to, to learn and read. And, and I'm teaching various courses and doing weekends and lectures and yeah. things on various different aspects of Beethoven as the year goes on. Um, at least some of which are definitely still in my diary. So... Yeah. I've got huge stacks of CDs to be listening to um, and lectures to plan and books to read, um, which is giving me off. Right. And I'm reading a lot of murder mysteries in between because why wouldn't you, frankly? Um, so, so that's all very enjoyable. So I think uh, last question before we sign off then, um, is, there, is there one piece of music or one composer that you think we should definitely be listening to whilst we're at home um, with leisure time to go digging around in repertoire? Oh, so this would be recordings, or if you could get the sheet music. Well, I mean, 
I guess either. I, I don't. I, I fully um, expect that that members of our audience are are players and singers as well. Yeah. Um, I would encourage people who like song to examine Robert France. Mm. Um, the songs are. I'm trying to think of one that's longer than three minutes, and I'm struggling. But the songs are generally a minute to a minute and a half, and they are sort of the step between Schubert and Wolf. They're, and they're extraordinary. There's only three, maybe four volumes of them. Uh, and there's a, and there's a, on, what's the website that you can, that lists music? Which one are you thinking of? The one that's, uh, that does the out of date music. Oh, not, IMSLP. Exactly. There is a volume of it on, on, of France, uh, song album on that. Um, and it's a great place to start. The music is, spectacular and you may have recorded a little of this uh we d we did record it a few years ago uh <laughs> yes that was i went through i don't know 50 opuses of music to to choose the ones that we did um but i, I was staggered at how good this these songs were absolutely amazing i didn't know any of them before we did that recording and they're just amazing Fantastic. So we can we can download the score, play through what we fancy at home, and then and then get hold of your CD and listen to the pros in action performing the same stuff. <laughs> if you'd like, yes. <laughs> Fabulous. But read, read Graham's notes about it. They're really good. Brilliant. Excellent. Well, look. Thank you so much for chatting to me, Robin. And uh, have fun in the garden. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. Then. Bye.